aspect of their opposition. So they have a, made it tougher than it should be. But essentially, the governor has to argue that it's COVID related, that it was not program the, the money was not programmed in the previous budget. And if she can do that, then she can spend the money. Now, even with those limitations, there's still a wide latitude of funding that the governor can use. And she's used it. For example, she announced recently a small business program where grants would be given to small business. That's coming out of the COVID fund. Uh, she's used it significantly for health care support, uh, standing up the emergency hospitals, which we would need if there was a further outbreak of COVID. Um, but she has had lots of flexibility. The problem is that uh, we want to make it the COVID money. We want to increase it first. But second, we want to make it more flexible. One thing, it, it runs out at the end of the year. And state budgets don't run out at the end of the year. They go all the way through to the following June 30th. Uh, and I think if we give the, the states more flexibility and increase the resources, they'll be better positioned. If we don't do that, then you're going to be running into furloughs, significant cuts. As you know, uh, the, the budget office has ordered every agency to plan 15% less funding next year if they don't get additional resources. That's a significant hit. That translates into jobs. So, uh, it also translates into economic activity. When you're a developer and you want to go ahead and build something, you have to get a permit from DEM, you have to get other permits. And if those agencies are understaffed and it takes them five weeks to do it rather than five days, then that's going to affect the economy in the state of Rhode Island. So we think that this is critical and we're working awfully hard. The HEROES Act that passed the House in May has a significant amount of additional money for the states along the lines of my funding together with much more flexibility. That's what we want. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to move on to some of the questions that have been submitted uh, by people here on the call with us. Um, uh, Ted Peets has the first question regarding um, broadband. Ted, do you want to ask your own question? Sure, I will. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, Ted. Hey, Ted. Good morning. I just wanted to expand on the CARES Act funded. So New Hampshire's congressional delegation had called for an extension of CARES Act funding, obviously, and that would support critical infrastructure updates. So, the CARES Act money in New Hampshire can be used to expand broadband in New Hampshire. However, Rhode Island does not qualify because we have good enough broadband. Yeah. A lot of Rhode Island has at least 25 megabits per second down, 3 megabits per second upload speed. So the FCC declares that we're not really eligible for federal funding. So that leads to really my question is, the FCC's definition of what broadband is is really actually badly outdated. To say that three megabits per second upload speed is not good enough in the year 2020, especially when so many people need it for telehealth, for distance learning, uh, moving to the cloud economy. And if we could update the FCC's definition of what broadband is, then a lot of Rhode Island would become more eligible for right. money such as CARES Act funding. And we're, we're missing the boat on federal funds because the definition of what broadband is. And that's my question. Well, your question is excellent, and you're exactly right. The FCC has been behind the curve in terms of modernizing their approach to broadband and modernizing their approach to what is sufficient. Uh, they have an old definition. They haven't worked it. They should change it. What we've tried to do with two pieces of legislation is to uh, provide direct assistance to states regardless of the FCC criteria. One is uh, Senator Wyden's legislation, which basically would provide resources directly to families, uh, both cash and some additional support uh, so that they could connect. The whole goal is to get everyone connected. The second uh, legislation is uh, sponsored by Senator Markey of Massachusetts, and that would be more institutionally based. That would give resources and money to libraries and schools so that they have the equipment to participate. 
then there's also the possibility uh, instead of direct FCC grants that this is one of those areas where the, they're under this COVID fund that we talk, just talked about, the governor might have the possibility of providing some, some resources to um, particularly institutions in terms of getting schools up to speed with, with uh, the, the right technology, the right equipment, et cetera. But the reality is, and this is something we're trying to deal with in this new round of COVID funding, is that one of the obstacles to getting back to school is children have to have access to good Wi-Fi broadband. They have to have a computer or a device. And there are a lot of kids that don't have that. And so I think as part of our educational effort, as well as just broadband, we have to put more money into making sure every child uh, has access to school. And that's something we're trying to work on. And that's one of the frustrating things about you know, leaving without passing the, the, that hero's bill or variation of it. But you're, the FCC, we have to work on them. They are a regulatory agency. Um, they uh, move at their own speed, one and two. Sometimes they move it, and not sometimes, many times, they move at the direction of the administration. And I don't think the administration has seen this as a, as a priority and they haven't forced them to, to, to take action and they should. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to, we have town, town councilor Daniela Abbott with us this morning and she has an infrastructure related question uh, regarding our roads and funding. So Daniela, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Hi, Terry. Um, good morning, Senator Reed. Thank you so much hey, for uh, taking the time to join us this morning. So I have a, um, I am on the town council here in Portsmouth, and we just went through a process of um, identifying priorities for our town staff and our town administrator uh, specifically. And in the discussion, it it's pretty evident that the number one concern that comes up uh, most frequently with our constituents and residents in Portsmouth is our roads, mm -hmm. particularly two main state owned roads, East Main Road and West Main Road. Right. So we are currently working with Rhode Island DOT to do a safety assessment on East Main Road because it is the main um, travel corridor for people mm -hmm. that live in Portsmouth. Um, it's a, <laughs> to put it kindly, it's a subpar road. <laughs> the road right. is a, the lanes are very narrow. Um, there's two lanes in either direction with zero shoulder, no sidewalks. The, the road has pretty you know, obvious and monumental infrastructure um, issues that uh, need to get addressed you know, in the long term. Right now, RIDOT is, they completed their safety assessment and they're gonna be making a presentation to the town council on the 24th and um, you know, the, the road is kind of a safety concern. We looked at the accident statistics and we have on average an accident every other day on that road. We had um, a young girl that was hit in a pedestrian crosswalk last summer. Uh, somebody was hit in a scooter trying to cross the road uh, two weeks ago also. So like we have to do something. And um, right now RIDOT is considering doing a road diet and reducing, you know, adding a turning lane, reducing to one lane on either side so that we have shoulders Anyway, you, you kind of get the idea. Um, mm -hmm. Our issue now as a town council is it's not our road, so we don't pay for it. We have to work with RIDOT on it. The real long-term solution for that road would be to consider uh, undergrounding utilities in some key areas so we can e at least add a shoulder. It's, you know, it's a big project. But when we look at the funding that comes to our town and to Aquidneck Island in general, frankly, mm -hmm. from, from RIDOT, we're never really a priority. Um, there's a lot of money being spent on on bridges, mm -hmm. you know, specifically in the, the, the Providence, Cranston, mm -hmm. Warwick area. They put in a ton of new roundabouts in Warwick and it, we just have not gotten any traction in mm -hmm. Portsmouth to really address these issues in a fundamental way. Now, I know, I believe that a few, maybe 10 or 15 years back, you were able to get us a, um, a grant and I there's a lot of rumors going around I don't know exactly the mechanism to try to address some of the the issues yeah. in our our you know downtown area near near Clements but 
half of that money was spent. The other half was never spent. Nothing has ever been done. And um, there, <laughs> it's been a challenge to try to, to find a, a right pathway forward. And I, I think that without federal dollars, this is an issue that will never get addressed properly. So that was not really a question. That was me <laughs> venting, <No. laughs> venting my concerns and my frustration. And uh, I, what can we do? Well, first of all, you're right. About 10 years ago, uh, we were able to help directly because those were, as they, we say, the good old days. We used yeah. to be able to procure what were known as earmarks. So we could go into the transportation appropriations budget and identify a specific project in a specific community and the state would just have to do it. Those yeah. earmarks were eliminated. That was part of the, the great revolution of the Republicans when they came in. I think, frankly, and many Republicans do too, is that it'd be good to get back there because we could go ahead and leap over some of these state issues and go right to the communities and help. But that's not the situation at the moment. In the interim, what I've tried to do is to increase the amount of money that's coming to the state because when the state has more money, then they have more opportunities to help every community. In the last four years, we have obtained more than $425 million in addition to our formula. Every state gets a formula from the federal government based on several factors, including the population, getting back to the census. But th this is all extra money. Yeah, just yesterday we announced that the state received a grant for the viaduct in Providence, the, the complex of uh, all those roads in front of the, uh, the, the mall, the downtown mall. Uh, we also received money, uh, again, another grant for 146, not in Portsmouth, but it's in Rhode Island. The point I think is that the state now, when they come and brief you, is in a much better position to uh, fund these projects because of the additional federal money they receive. It's a significant amount of money. And you can remind them of that. That's saying if you've received $425 million extra over the last four years, why haven't we seen some of that money? So you can do that. Uh, I will. And then, and we're still trying to, we're still trying to get additional resources into the state. One other small point I should say, you, you, you pointed out that there is a, a, a lot of bridge work being done. And that is a direct result of something I did on the Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. I created a funding mechanism for bridge repair nationally based on the status of the, the, the bridges in each state. It turned out, of course, Rhode Island was number one. In fact, received the most money of any state in the country. But that money has to be used for bridges. Yeah. And they are using it. The Henderson Bridge in uh, in Providence is being completely rebuilt. Uh, so, as you point out, several bridges along Route 95, you know, France and Providence Line are being rebuilt. But also, if you have bridges in the Portsmouth area that are um, in bad shape, bring those to the attention of the of the state because they are they have specific funds just for bridges. So, I, the bottom line I think is that. They are in a better position today than they've been in the last five years to fund pro projects throughout the state. They don't have all the money they need because unfortunately for the previous 10 or 20 years, they were receiving very, very little in terms of just the, the minimal formula and nothing else. But since I've been on the Appropriations Committee for Transportation, we've been able to put a lot of money into the state and other states too. And we hope to do more. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Darcy Rowland, who wants to switch topics a little bit and talk about the military. Uh, Darcy, are you able to chime in with your question? I am. Thank you, Terry. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Reed. Hi, so Darcy. I've got two questions and then kind of an example to summarize. So. Mm -hmm. um, my question, and I, I'm asking because I feel like this needs to have some external pushing for the military. Mm -hmm. Is there any push to uh, encourage or have the military do anti-racism training? And also to um, 
start including, especially with senior leadership, um, reviewing social media profiles as an extension of the person as opposed to just um, uh, their, their, their qualifications. And yeah. the reason I'm asking this is because I, I am retired military. I worked for about nine years at the Senior mm -hmm. Enlisted Academy. And I have a lot of friends who are still active duty military, and I see a lot of posts that I would call a benevolent, but leaning towards racist or biased posts. And I'll, I'll give an example. There's a lot of military people who very, through social media, express their, their, their hate and discontent for kneeling for the flag. And the reason this causes a problem in my eyes is because if you have a person who is black or brown who works for you and then they know your views on this issue if they view colin kaepernick as their hero and you go to a, a social function they can't wear their jersey and now they've got to conform with what the ideology is of their leader and it creates a problem and the leaders don't realize that it's actually an issue because they see it as supporting the flag not necessarily anything else. So that's really, you know, what I, I, I would be curious from a congressional level if there's right. any push, because I feel like that's where the, the, the push needs to come from. And I see the Air Force is doing a lot of work, but I haven't seen a lot from all the other services. Well, first of all, thank you for your service. And uh, yeah. I served on active duty from 1967 to 1979. And the issues there were even more uh, stark and relevant because that was an era where the civil rights movement in the United States was, was, was taking hold. And uh, so we saw um, from that day to the day, there's been progress, but not enough. Let me uh, point out too that, you know, there, there are some hopeful signs. Uh, General Brown, the chief of staff of the Air Force, the first uh, chief of staff of any service in the history of the United States to be uh, an individual of color. Uh, he's a very talented former commander of the Pacific Air Force. He came in. The other thing, too, I think it was notable, too, is what, after the, the Floyd killing in Minnesota, the uh, command sergeant major of the Air Force, an African-American, wrote an incredibly moving and um, very, very, very strong sort of a statement about race, not just in the society, but in the military. So we're beginning to see literally and more visibly concern about this issue that you so adroitly pointed out because it's subtle, it's there, it's always there. Secretary Esper, the Secretary of Defense, about two or three weeks after the Floyd killing, issued a Defense Department Secretary guidelines about race and about uh, racial uh, you know, behavior, et cetera. But the point you make is, is really a, a very good point, and that is this social media, because there's now, unlike my days, back in the, the good old days when it was all just in the, bar you know, in the barracks and shooting the breeze, now on social media, you can have uh, individuals who are involved with uh, groups that are not exactly supportive of racial equality or they're, you know, they're saying things that are uh, unfortunate and they're being, you know, being read by others uh, and that's causing a problem. So I will bring this idea of social media back to the, to the Department of Defense folk. I think it's an excellent one. Uh, but to your point, uh, there is, I think, a constant recognition that as much as they do, they don't do enough. And I think the, the best, again, the best evidence of at least the most visible evidence is that we're beginning to make some progress is you're beginning to see now uh, the very, very senior levels of uh, general officers and senior sergeant, sergeant majors of color. And that's probably the best thing you can do. Uh, uh, so it's an excellent point, and I'll follow up. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Darcy. Thank you, Senator. Um, our last question that I've had formally submitted, it comes from Joanna so Sochi. Um, would you like to uh, chime in, Joanna? Sure. Hi, Senator Reed. Hi, Thank Joanna. You. 
taking. I'm Joanna Skokie from the ARC Rhode Island and also Rhode Island Advocacy for Children. And um, as you know, the federal law IDEA, um, which provides for a free and appropriate public education for children with disabilities or most vulnerable children, um, has been really never fully funded. Well, it hasn't been fully funded. Um, right now during COVID, these children, the families I work with are devastated uh, financially, uh, mental health wise, um, learning, their children are falling behind in learning. What is your office doing to A, try to get more funding for children, uh, disadvantaged youth and children with disabilities, and also, what is your office doing to keep the protections in place? Because I know in the spring when COVID first started, there was real fear that the um, secretary of uh, the uh, commissioner of the uh, Department of Education, Betsy DeVos, would uh, give waivers to the state, which would allow them to kind of not provide the services and supports. So and right now in Rhode Island, our education system is devastated and these children are not getting the supports and services. Families are crumbling around us and yet there's no full funding, which is, is wrong. <laughs> been wrong well, for years well, and years. It is wrong. We are fighting for the full funding. I've been doing it since I got there. As you know, uh, the, the original IDEA called for a 60-40 split federal state, and we've never never even got close to, I think, 50%. So it it's, uh, leaves the state holding the bag, literally. So we're trying to push that. That has, again, year in and year out for 20 years, we have not been successful. Uh, we are in, a, in an individual basis, our staff is responsive to families who will call us and say they have a problem. And we encourage people, if they feel they have no place to turn, call us. We have uh, got tremendous colleagues that will take the case up. They'll, you know, they'll work through our Washington office, the, the Department of Education, they'll work locally. So we want to help, we'll do the best we can. The other issue of money is it goes back to this the crisis is that's why we, we originally put in the, the $1.25 billion COVID fund because it gives the governor flexibility to use this for special COVID related and obviously one population is the special education population where you have to do some extra things you didn't have to do before before COVID. That's one aspect. Getting ready for this new school year, we hoped we could pass before we left in, in August, uh, another major uh, multi-trillion dollar bill, which would have given the state additional money, which they could have focused on schools, and particularly, how do you connect children with learning disabilities? Um, some of them, basically, they have to be physically in contact with their instructor so you have to have special uh, protections for them, protections for the teacher, that costs money. Others might need technology, but it's not just a laptop. It might be even more sophisticated technology because of their condition. That costs money. These families don't have money. And of course, you know, it's one thing if you're, if you're fortunate enough to be middle or upper middle class, but if you're a poor family and you have got disabled children, you've got a real problem. So that's how, that's what we're trying to do. The key I think comes down and you put your finger on initially, it's money. Uh, we should fully fund IDEA like we, we intended to 30 years ago when we passed it. And then we should have specialized money for the COVID vi uh, virus through the, these bills we're passing. So my question would be just one quick follow up is how can we help your office get this done and create a push, not only in our state, but nationally? Well, I think that, you know, there is a very strong, because we are in constant contact with uh, the special education community, both the instructors and the families. So we, there is, there is a, this doesn't go unnoticed. It's just, and it's nationwide too, my colleagues across the country too. But it's just one of those things that um, we're pushing, pushing very hard 
and we get a little progress, but we don't get enough. Um, and uh, again, you've had a situation where uh, when the Republicans took over the Congress in 2010, they insisted on the Budget Control Act, which stopped, essentially put a, a real halt on domestic spending. So our ability to expand uh, special education spending was curtailed. And that there's still, you know, that insistence upon um, you know, curtailing investment. I say it's investment, really. I mean, education is, is not, so it's spending, yes, but it's investment more than anything else. And so that's one of the other obstacles we've run into. But um, there is a very strong parent and professional network in the state of Rhode Island. We're in close contact with them. Um, it's just trying to, it's just trying to get the, you know, get more money at a time when there are so many other demands for more money. When you talk about the range of issues, I mean, healthcare in terms of COVID, affordable housing in terms of that's a crisis we're seeing throughout the state. Uh, you're talking about job training now because the economy is changing so quickly. All of those uh, forces are, are, are competing with uh, special education funding and it, it makes it very difficult. Thank, thank you, Joanna, for that question. And thank you, Senator, for the response. Yes. We've, we've had a, a slight technical glitch on, on the recording and uh, the recording failed in the part of your discussion on the census. And so if you, if you people could bear with us, if you wanted to repeat your, um, All right. your census uh, commercial. And, My uh, census commercial. <laughs> First of all, let me thank uh, you, Terry, for your great work on the census at the state level. Uh, it's critical for many reasons. First, uh, it will determine whether we have two representatives or one representative. We're very close in terms of the number of the population of the state of Rhode Island. And secondly, it will determine funding for so many programs, and we talked about many of them today, uh, over 10 years, not just one year, two years, over a whole decade. So we've got to get it right. And that means getting people to fill out the census. And we've had some problems. The president tried to disrupt the whole process initially by uh, introducing this question of citizenship, which the Supreme Court rejected. Uh, however, for months, he was able to frighten or to inhibit many, many people who otherwise might have signed up right away because they were afraid. They didn't know. Uh, uh, even though the Supreme Court ruled constitutionally, as they should have, in, in favor that every person, not citizen, every person should be reported, uh, the president was able to distract and to, and to divert attention as he's so good at. Now he's talking about cutting back the census by a month, which means obviously fewer days, particularly at the end when you're trying to get that peak last minute effort, get people uh, out literally out the door or on the, online. And you can fill the census out online. There's no excuse not to, you know, to do it. So he's trying that. And again, this is a very concerted effort to suppress uh, the number of people who sign up. They, that's their goal. And the goal should be to get every person in the United States to register in the census so we know who we have. We know demographic trends. We know a whole plethora of information that will help us. So for the next several weeks, uh, census, 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 we still have time. Get, get it in. You can do it online so you don't have to wait for someone to knock on your door. And please, and again, thank you, Terry, because you've led it the way here in Rhode Island. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the um, questions up to people on the call that didn't have a chance to write in. Does anybody have a question for the Senator? Well, in our last few minutes of time with him. Jonathan, over. Good morning, Senator. First, uh, let me Hi, thank Jonathan. you for always taking the time on behalf of your constituents. Uh, you were kind enough to step out of a Space Force hearing when I came to call on you in uh, DC last year and say a quick hello. And Steve Keenan in your office has been 
Very helpful for to work uh, to take Rhode Island's flagship and expand opportunities with the Oliver Hazard Perry. Um, you know, we first met when you were touring shipyard facilities here in Rhode Island that had received NARAD small shipyard grants. And I think about the challenges that we're facing as a community and the need for infrastructure improvement, and that starts with people. And I'm wondering how we can convince your colleague, because I think you and, and our delegation understand this, but at a national level, that this is a, you know, we're, we're engaged in a war, a domestic war on a thing. And I look at what the United States was capable of in World War II and the infrastructure improvements and the upskilling and the engagement of our citizenry to respond to a crisis and how we convince our colleagues nationally to do that and how here in Rhode Island, we can broaden the, the scope and impact of federal funds beyond just the physical infrastructure like a shipyard grant to fast track things like the Maritime Center of Excellence that Marad Marad's program there with community colleges and similar, so we can put people back to work in the advanced industries that ensure that lifelong uh, economic stability that will then allow them to engage more fully as uh, good citizens and you know participate in the process to build a resilient Rhode Island. So is there something that, that we can be doing as citizens? Do you think that there's something that we should be lobbying more aggressively uh, at the federal level to sort of get the dollars flowing into the states to invest in the people? No, I think, Jonathan, that your points are extremely well taken. I think uh, you've really hit the key. Our advantage in the past, and it has to be our advantage in the future, is human capital. Uh, not so much facilities and factories, but the skills of our workforce. And I think for a while we neglected that. First of all, there was a lot of outsourcing being done. And I think we're beginning to, to recognize that's maybe not the smartest approach. Second, uh, there was just uh, uh, not the kind of attention that we need to pay for uh, increased skills. And what we've seen, and I'm particularly pleased at some of the things at the community college and some of the other uh, universities and colleges around is an active collaboration with industry. Uh, one of the really impressive places is the uh, training center down in Wesley for electric boat. That's just first rate. It's the community college, it's the Wesley school system, the parked up school system and electric boat partnering, not just government, but partner, private public partnership. And they're getting young, not so young people and getting them right from the, the, the training center onto the floor of electric boat. And last year, electric boat hired over 2,000 people. And those are good, good jobs in the lab. But we've got to do that in every area, not just uh, submarine construction. We've got to be thinking about that in biotechnology. How do we get that biotechnology center? We've got to be thinking in terms of also our education program in elementary and secondary school. How do we start exposing young people to not the traditional, you're gonna to go to college and get a degree, but you know maybe you wanna do something in the high tech field as, as in terms of uh, mechanical rather than, than just intellectual or you, you, we better do all these things. Um, and there, one is funding, two is what you've been doing so well is advocating in DC and around for this exactly this type of partnership. Uh, and I think there's a recognition. One of the things that's happened over the last, with the COVID particularly, when, the, when we recognize that the chip production, microelectronic chip production, was located in essentially three places, Taiwan, China, and South Korea. And we realize that the heart of our industrial strength is based upon having chips. We sort of said, we've got we to change this. So you're now seeing people, you know, my colleagues, begin to think about how do we onsource not only the physical factory, but the intellectual horsepower. And that's gonna, I think, that'd be something we're gonna take up as we sort of rebuild our economy. So all of these things together, I think, will make a difference and we have to make a difference. But thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your ongoing support. Thanks. Um, on that similar topic, could you talk a little bit about what the 401 Tech Bridge, uh, that recent grant that just got announced, could you talk a little bit about that? 
the 401 tech bridge uh, is going to go to the state, the employment and training, and they, again, they're going to have the flexibility to start looking beyond sort of the mechanical machinist type work that, we, that is done at Electric Boat into some of these more, these newer type of pursuits, artificial intelligence training, uh, how to work with, with, with machines, uh, computerization, et cetera, biotechnology. Uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be useful. I think it'll be a good first step. It won't be the, the full answer, but it's a good first step. Yes, I think uh, we're going to have uh, some of that 401 Tech Bridge money, I'm hoping, is going to be uh, come to fruition right here in Portsmouth with the Composite Alliance. Um, and so I think that will be a great addition to our community. Does anybody else have a question this morning for the Senator? Jenny, I know you had raised um, a question about the post office. Did you have a fault? Do you have any follow up or are you satisfied with what you heard this morning? Jenny Kroll. Jenny Kroll. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if you were talking to me. Yeah, about... I'm sorry. Well, good morning, just, Jenny. Yeah, good morning. And good morning, Senator. Good morning, Jenny. Uh, I just think that we have got to take this uh, situation very seriously. And the post I, office. I wanted, yeah, post office situation, um, because uh, we've got we've got to put some special effort into the fact that we've got to uh, make sure that all those votes get in, and um, and I think that that's maybe uh, it needs a few more citizens to jump in and see whether they can help out with that, because uh, uh, if it's not going to be, uh, I know I you know I was a Navy wife. I depend on that post office an awful lot, you know? And, I know. And, and that sort of thing. And so um, we can't just let it slip by. We've got to be very careful about what's going on. We've got to express our opinions that it's got to be changed. And, and when he says, well, we're going to stop, uh, we're, I'm not going to make any more changes. How about revoking the changes that you've already made? And uh, that type of thing. I think you're absolutely right, Jenny, because I think what they'd like to do is just, okay, we won't we won't alter any more sorting machines, but they've already taken several out yeah. of Providence. Yeah. They have yeah. to put them back. Yes. And what they yeah. have to do is, again, ironically, just like the good old days of the holidays, they have to say, listen, we're gonna make sure every Christmas card and Hanukkah card gets out. We're gonna make sure every vote, that's our goal. It's not, you know, we're gonna tell you, you, you won't get all your votes in. We're gonna say, we're gonna get all your I votes in. Now you, you're gonna have to work with us, but we're gonna get it done. I wanted to say one more thing about the census. Um, I had a friend of mine who was having a very hard time filling out their census report. Mm -hmm. And um, I recommended that they use the telephone number there to call in and see if they could get some help. They got help very quickly. Sure. So don't feel, don't feel like you can't use that telephone number and call in. They called in and they said they would call them back and they did call them back. Yeah. And they were able to do it right over the phone. So people who don't have the technology to go ahead and fill it out on the internet and are a little bit uh, t touchy about how they're filling it out mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. you can call in and they were very helpful. No, I think you're absolutely right. First of all, we have a full-time dedicated census staff. You know, they're, they're there for years. So many of them are long time civil servants. They've done five census, or I mean five is too much, it's every 10 years, but they've done three or four censuses and they know what to do and they're mm -hmm. professional and they want to help. And what's happening, as I suggested, is it's from the political level, the presidential level, where all the smoke and all of the, you know, all of the, the effort to dissuade people not to do it. It's going to be dangerous. We're going to, you know, we'll, we'll be looking for you, et cetera. That's not from the professional. Once you get on the phone, once you speak to them, as I have, they're, they're, they do the job. Yeah. So thank you. And thank, thank you for you. your service. You're welcome. Thank In fact, you, you, vo you voted many times by mail, correct? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's it was a big thing. thing. And, and I trained practice. my children, the children too. You got to train well, your children. You know, I, to... voted, I voted by mail too. I was in the service for 12 years. And, and it seems to me that in one of the ironies here is the president's going around saying, oh, uh, voting by mail is so unreliable, it, it's all fraud. That's how most of our military personnel do it, or many of them do it, at least once in their, their career. 
Well, especially a, especially a, a Navy wife, because I'm not part of the military, so that I've got to maintain my my uh, place where I'm going to vote. And so right. I might just maintain my home here. And I uh, would, you had I to would send call. further stuff. And yeah. I call home to my father and I said, I talked to him about the, the school committee races because I didn't know who was running for school committee in Cranston, Rhode Island. I had an idea who I was voting for for president, but uh, other than that, and you know, senator and all the way down, but, and then I, I fill out my mail ballot and send it in. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's what you do. Well, thank that's you. That's what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Do, does anybody else have a question this morning? Bob. Robert Marshall. Thank you, Senator, for taking the time. Um, hey, Bob. I just was wondering, I was wondering if you could uh, speak about the, the new um, COVID funding that's, that's tied up and if, when yep. it does come out, um, if there is going to be some kind of a um, earmark for home and community-based services for the disabled. Um, it's been difficult. Um, a lot of the focus has been on nursing homes, rightfully so. There was a real problem there. Right. But the, um, the home and community base had pre-existing staffing problems too, and uh, they have just gotten worse with this. And um, it, without an earmark, I don't think it's going to get fixed. Well, uh, that's a very good point. I think one is uh, we're looking now, the latest I heard is that Speaker Pelosi is now suggesting, why don't we compromise at $2 trillion? I mean, the HEROES Act was three, which was very robust. It had covered a lot of, of elements that were absolutely necessary. The, the White House is talking, no, we're not gonna go above a trillion. Long story short, they might be able to reach an accommodation at, at, at two trillion. That, <clears throat> that'll put pressure on these uh, targeted specialized programs, uh, to be honest with you. So what it, it would leave, I think, is one of the things that we're trying to do in this uh, COVID bill is we're, again, money to the uh, states, but money directly to cities and towns with much more flexibility. And that might help augment some of the funding that you're getting already if you get money from the state and if you particularly you get any support from the town, that, that they would have resources to help you out. But uh, we will push, I'm sure there's a strong push to provide the support that you need, but uh, given the reluctance of the Republicans and given the fact that it now looks like the HEROES Act, which was at three trillion, will at best be two trillion, uh, some of the targeted funding that, that we hope we could get in will be difficult to get in. I'm, I'm being honest. Thank you. Do, do, you have, Thank you. do you have any other suggestions on how to get testing and staff supports to home and community based um, with the existing money? I think, again, I think, you know, and you're doing it already, you've got to first go through the state. The, 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 they've been the key sort of, uh, uh, you know, key factor in allocating the money, not just Rhode Island, but every state. Uh, part of that is because I think the, the, the Trump administration decided to abdicate responsibility totally to the states. So anyway, I would talk to the state, the key people in the state that you deal with about how do we, how do we get ourselves positioned to get money if we get the additional money? Uh, what claims are you making and what requests are you making to the state in terms of additional money? And then I think also too, it always helps to have the, the you know, that, that good solid analysis behind you by saying, if we put this money in this way, we will save X, Y, and Z. Uh, if you've got that analysis, that helps tremendously. So those are okay. a couple Thank of you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well, if there's no other questions, I wanna thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. And I want to thank the Senator, thank Senator you. Reed. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It Thanks, means Sarah. a lot to, to myself and to my constituents. Who, and we will put this up on, um, this will be recorded. Well, we have recorded, it'll be posted mm -hmm. so that people who couldn't join us can watch in at a time of their convenience. Thanks, Derek.
Thank you. Keep up your good work too, Jerry. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much. I really appreciate it.